better when you do better. You do better when I do better. Better as one, yeah, better together. Cause when I get out, come shout out loud. Rising up, we come together, yeah, taking center stage. It's her time, yeah, time for her to shine. She be on her way. Watch the guy just go, 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 take over like go, 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 rise up, let's go, 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 go. Fusion QT. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Outfest Fusion QT BIPOC Film Festival, an event that centers stories by and about LGBTQ plus people of color. My name is Cheryl Santa Cruz. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the programming manager at Outfest. The films, workshops, and events we have planned at Fusion virtually continue until Tuesday, April 20th. So it's not too late for you to check out all of our offerings on outfestfusion.com. Thank you for joining us today for the conversation, Yearning to Breathe Free, LGBTQIA plus immigration and asylum seekers. Over the past few years, we've noticed this theme come up in many films, whether as a small character detail in the background or up front and center. So we wanted to take this opportunity to dive deeper into this issue. We're gonna show you the trailers um, for two of the films in our program that do deal with these issues, um, Nowhere and Caught. Um, so you will find out a little bit about those films if you haven't yet seen them and they're available on our platform. Um, and then we're just gonna dive into the discussion, um, who, which will be moderated by film critic Carlos Aguilar, whose work has appeared in prestigious pu publications such as the LA Times, Variety, New York Times, IndieWire, Vulture, Mezcla, amongst many, many more. Um, and we will also have Ebe Tabachnik, film programmer and producer, join us as an interpreter. So um, watch the trailers and then we'll come back with, to you with the uh, discussion. Thanks. Nosotros tenemos nuestras cuentas de banco, compramos el café en la esquina, compram, vamos a hacer compras al supermercado. Nosotros vivimos en Queens. Nosotros necesitamos el respeto. Sí, yeah, señor. Estamos despenalizando el trabajo sexual para que ninguna persona que caiga retada sea criminalizada ahora en adelante. Were you ever arrested for prostitution? Por su visa. O sea, estamos haciendo un, un film donde estamos hablando la verdad de la, de la vida que se vive. De nosotras, las chicas trans, o sea, todas hemos pasado esto. Entonces, um, no es algo ficticio, es algo real.
Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Aguilar and I'm very excited to be uh, here today uh, with the filmmakers and other great panelists for this conversation. Thank you to Outfest Fusion for having me. Uh, first, I want to introduce the director of COD, uh, Nicola May. Thank you for joining us. And the co-directors of uh, Nowhere, uh, Francisco and David Salazar. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi guys. Thank you for being here. Um, well, thank you for sharing these wonderful uh, stories with us that are, you know, so relevant and, and specific. And I think that's always, you know, the goal to be specific about the stories uh, that are told uh, today. Uh, Nicola, I wanted to start by asking you, you know, um, how did you get involved with the, the story of trans women in Queens? And how did you ensure that as a cis man, you know, who's looking into this community, you know, reflected them uh, with respect and authenticity. What were the steps that you that you took to to ensure that in the film? Okay, thank you for this question, Carlos, and for this opportunity. Um, the uh, the film caught is actually the um, the result of a research project that uh, um, undertook uh, about eighteen to twenty four months of um, of uh, field work. So um, the relations with the Transgradiendo uh, Intercultural Collective, they were born out of a very long uh, uh, relationship and, uh, and, and uh, the, which were nurtured, you know, a, a long, um, you know, for, for a long duration. And the, the, the method that uh, um, the, the, the film adopted, which is uh, this mix of uh, collective writing and, uh, and more traditional documentary observational filmmaking uh, was devised in order precisely to make sure that the film expressed the sensibilities and lives of the people directly concerned, which is uh, uh, both an individual and a collective journey. So in, in that way, it, it was, um, so this is how I negotiated my own positionality, my own position as somebody who is not a member of the of the community by, by just making sure that uh, the process included the people directly concerned uh, in all of its steps. And, uh, and this is also why there is a feedback session in, in the film, just to, to make sure that uh, uh, they are in owning the terms of their own representation. Absolutely. Um, for David and Francisco, tell us a little about the background behind, you know, the interest in wanting to tell this story that about, it's a love story that, you know, it, it's really, you know, uh, changed and, and, you know, uh, transformed by outside factors that go beyond, you know, what's in the hands of these characters. So I think my brother and I uh, had been, we, we mentioned before in, in previous uh, talks we've had that we had started with two different scripts, one that was very much angled on the LGBT relationship and another one that really focused on uh, family and immigration in, in the U.S. And I think we always wanted to kind of um, take on the issue of immigration from a very different perspective from what we'd seen generally happening in a lot of the mainstream films here in the U.S. Um, and at the time, you know, we were both um, doing our master's degrees and we were, you know, working with a lot of foreign students, international students. And, you know, we had a couple of close friends, me in particular, I had a friend in, from Colombia who was trying to figure out how he would be able to remain in the States. And we had a couple of conversations about him when my brother and I decided we were going to combine the two screenplays that we'd been working on into one. And a lot of the information that he gave me about his experience ended up being kind of a template for where we would take the story from there. And then we did some research with uh, our, from our own family perspective of immigration. Um, we asked questions to some of our family who had immigrated um, from Colombia. And uh, we spoke to, I think a lawyer and we spoke and we spoke to different other people. So that's, and that's how we basically created um, the crux of, of that of the story. Nicola, you know, I really enjoy the the sort of hybrid, uh, you know, uh, structure of, of this film that really sort of blends the reality and then fictionalizes some in some scenes. And I, 
I wanted to ask you about, you know, empowering, uh, you know, the trans community by letting them act themselves in the stories and how did that, did that go about in, the, in terms of the fictionalization of some of these real stories on screen? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, this is one of an aspect of uh, of my films uh, before. It's 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 a research method I I have adopted as a way to because um, I have an, another you know another life as a, as a professor of sociology, and so um, one of the methods through which uh, an interesting research data and information can be obtained is 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 through a fictionalized process through which people can. Uh, you know, engage together in a creative uh, way that allows people who don't want to speak in the first person sometimes to talk about a character. And so the character becomes a, um, a, a typology. It, it becomes an imaginary character that is somebody, and, uh, and, but it is also everybody, you know? And, and so this is, this is how it went. It, we, we did uh, workshops. Uh, I mean, the project lasted four years, right? So the, the, the workshops, um, and enabled us to to meet every every month, uh, sorry, every week for several months, and they lasted quite a long time, like three to four hours, and we just uh, started building the character. So the question would be, if you were to tell a story about your your community, and 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 send a message to to the world through a film, what what would it be like? Like what would be the story? Who would be the protagonists? And 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 why? And and uh, it was just like um, this. This is this was the process. Yeah, it, it it took quite a lot of time to 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 build it, but it was very nice because it enabled us to to have an actual connection because there was there's lots of interest in these uh, in these topics, and uh, and I was very flattered and 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 and, and happy that uh, I was accepted um, that this that this project was accepted by the community. But I think it was accepted because of this method. Absolutely. Uh, Francisco and David, you know, the, the title of your film uh, uh, to me is very, you know, very telling of this sense of how this couple cannot be together, whether it's here or back home, because they're each facing, uh, you know, their own sort of struggles with you know, their sexual orientation and the immigration status. Uh, tell me a little bit about choosing that title and what it signifies for you and for these characters in the film. So the, uh, for, for us, titles are always, always come at the end um, of the process. And when we were discussing um, the title of the film, originally it was called Adrian and Sebastian, and we didn't think that really worked or, or talked about the, the experience. Um, it, we, were, we, were, we were just talking about the themes of the film, and, we, we, and one of our producers came up with, with Nowhere, and we realized it, it worked really well because none of the, as you say, none of the characters, they really know where they belong. And they're basically, as they say, from from nowhere at that at that moment. So it was kind of, kind of that process when when we came up with it. it was it was at the very end of, of the process when when it, when it came. It was a very serendipitous moment actually because we had been literally sit, sitting down talking for an hour about what the title might be, and we threw in a lot of different ideas. And I think when the, the word nowhere was thrown in there, it just felt it just fit it just fit really well. In, in for all of you and having these conversations about intersectionality, one of the things that, that you know that I notice in your films is the, uh, the the factor of language, right? In nowhere, there's a very small but important scene which you know a co-worker of Adrian refuses to to speak to him in Spanish, and then in you know in uh, in caught, you know there's the idea of like a lot of these women don't speak English and who speaks for them and how do they you know do they have a voice in the system? Uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about you know the how language plays a role in, in, in the you know injustice and and it, how identity and immigration plays in the U.S. Well, I think referring to that scene, um, we had spoken a lot about about that originally. The the, the role had been cast for uh, uh, someone else, but we got this actress, and we had played onto the fact that you know she's she is a, a Latina, but she wants to she's in power and she wants to assimilate to to the world, and so. Uh, by assimilating, you have to speak English, and there's no Spanish allowed, and anything like that. And we've seen that in our own in our own experiences. How you know, even if you do speak it's the same language in common, uh, there's this perception that if you speak something uh, different, you're you're going to be uh, like kind of a, a, another othered or, or something like that. So we wanted to create that sense sense of, of like. I, I mean, I want to keep my power, so I have to assimilate to that. Otherwise, I, I can, 
you know, there, there's also risks of me losing that power. Also speaking to the fact that she was, she's also a woman who, who has a, who has a, who has a, a job in power. She's a woman of color. And, 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 you know, in the U S I think that's, that sometimes can be very rare. So that was something that we, we really wanted to create in, in terms of that scene. But I think it was also really important to create, um, to give that authenticity of language so that when they're, when Adrian and Sebastian are together, they do speak Spanish, they do still maintain that part of their culture and with their friends, they're all, it's all in English. And that, and that, that also creates a, a difference in, in relationship. Nicola, you want to talk about uh, how language plays in COD? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean uh, the the film is is a uh, is an anthropological documentary, and so so the language that um, that is in the film is the language that it's spoken in 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 the real world that the film attempts to portray. Um, and and many of of of, uh, of the women in the film they have a, a functional uh, English, which is more about understanding things. But but when it comes down to articulate, you know, expressing and participating in in, in, in debates. Uh, they, they they struggle and 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 I think this is this, this really mirrors the the marginalization of, of the community. I mean, not everybody to the same extent, of course. The community includes people who are super fluent in English, and they are the ones who then mediate. But uh, the, the very fact that the film is uh, and the title of the film in Spanish re reflects the 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 point of view from which the phenomena that it describes are framed. It's 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 the way. The people directly concerned, you know, experience New York. They experience the U.S. and their migration journey, including their, you know, their their sessions with the uh, with the lawyers. And language is is a very big, um, you know, gap in terms of having direct access to resources and to and also to political activism because sex work activism, unfortunately, it's still pretty much English speaking and 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 the Latino movement. Latinx movement um, uh, is struggling to join forces. Sometimes it's getting better, but you know it's it's a fragmented movement because of language issues. Totally. Before we open up to some of the other panelists, Nicola, I wanted to ask you about the inclusion of Lorena Borjas, uh, the late Lorena Borjas, in in the film, uh, who was a, a fierce advocate for for the trans uh, Latinx community in the U.S. and you know having her immortalized in in your film. Yes, uh, it, it's. Um, I, I I feel a tremendous responsibility, um, you know, having Lorena uh, in the film, and and the film, you know, documents also her heritage and her legacy, uh, it, because it shows Lorena at work. Um, it's um, it's it's really uh, a privilege to have met Lorena. Uh, she really wanted the film. It was something that uh, that she really wanted. Uh, to happen exactly because uh, uh, she wanted uh, and the whole community wanted to be heard and to and their stories to you know to get out there in a bigger circuit of uh, of communication that uh, is normally accessible to them um, so the film is dedicated to Lorena because uh, uh, she passed away last year on the 30th of March she was one of the first uh, COVID uh, victims uh, in the US one of the first uh, you know wave and um, yes, I mean, it's, um, it was a tragic loss for the community. Uh, Lorena was the mother of, 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 the, of the community, in, of the trans women in Queens. And she, um, and the love for her, I hope that the love that was circulated through the community via her uh, comes out, you know, comes out in the film. And then the film honors her, her memory and her, and her heritage, you know, her legacy. Absolutely. Uh, I want to bring, bring on now uh, Ishala Ortega, who is a former client of the Immigration Equality Organization. Uh, Ish, uh, Ishala, are you here with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Ishala, I wanted to, to ask if you, you know, I don't know if you had a chance to see the films, but, you know, if you... Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, in this sort of uh, from your very intersectional position in, in in the United States and how this organization, you know, played a role in in supporting you. Yeah, my my um, well, immigration equality was the one who um, take over my case. I'm originally from Tijuana, Mexico. I had to run and leave, flee the country because of my political activism. And as a transgender woman in the United States who was able to 
fix the status, go to college, have a career, work as a, as a coordinator in a, in a health center, and all of that, and overcome a lot of barriers and um, break a lot of crystals uh, ceilings. Um, I think that the movie make a really, really good, especially Kat, that is the one um, that represent part of my community. I think it makes a, a really good job in portraying um, one of the biggest um, situations that my community face, which is the profession of sex work and the criminalization of such profession. Um, I do believe that it's extremely important that um, everybody notice that um, the sex work is, is an option left for trans people by society in general. It is not something we choose. It's something that is being put to us as a label of that's the only option for us to survive at the very beginning of our transition. Of course, we, have in a new, we are living in a new era in which we can um, choose some other professions because we need to do that and we need to be part of all of these um, um, circles of society in, in, in the world. And um, unfortunately, so many people who migrate from our Latin America countries or other countries around the world, they only know sex work as a profession, as a, a way of surviving. And being in the United States is, is something that we need to continue doing because the language barrier uh, are not other skills to work. And sometimes the only known of like living um, I understand the um, the activism to decriminalize sexual sex sex work, which is extremely important because nobody that survive uh, through a so social crime should be penalized. That is something extremely important to to put on stone. You know, like this is what we are doing because you let us do this only. But at the same time, we need to um, raise our voices to bring. Um, access to these communities, to education and to other options. So we actually choose to be sex workers out of multiple options, because this is the message that is being like sent out as in like decriminalized sex work. But at the same time, we are losing the fact that we do not have other options. So we need to work through those, those two messages. It's decriminalized people who, who commit survival crimes, but at the same time provide those communities, especially the transgender community, options, because that's what we don't have, options. And yes, sex work is something uh, that um, morally is not well seen, but it is the only options we have. How does the, the, the immigration aspect impact the, those choices and sort of the, the, the struggles of the trans community? Well, the immigration impacts because um, the fact that you don't have documents to uh, apply for a job, to go to college and do all of that, you only are left behind to do specifically sex works. There is a lot of people who do sex works who are like cosmetologists or people who went to school in their countries, but they do not speak the language. They don't, they, they cannot get a, a license to perform their um, previous knowledge in other uh, activities. And because they don't have the papers fixed yet or, or their status fixed yet, uh, the only option is to do sex works. And yes, they uh, get other, you know, like hustler in, in another type of uh, work, like showbiz, but it's not well paid. Uh, a lot of other things that we do to survive, but at the same time is the lack of options. At the moment, we don't have papers that put us, put us or mandate us to be in that position of being sex workers. Okay, and you know, before we move on to to another one of our great panelists, uh, I wanted to ask you, Shal, about the importance of you know having these stories being told in film and in media, and particularly when you know the trans community uh, is itself participant and being you know a crucial component of, of how these stories are being told. It is extremely important to for us to do that. Uh, it is, uh, um, you know, like a sort of two ends because, uh, yes, it is important for people to know the existence of the trans community in Queens, for example, if we're going to go specific, but it's, it's a situation that goes around the um, the country. But pointing out the people in, in Queens who are sex workers 
It is also put them in jeopardy because police will harass them most. I mean, more than they are already being harassed. So it is extremely important to be very specific about like what's going on. But at the same time, it is important for those who are trying to put their stories in the media to understand that giving like places where they work, their faces, their names and stuff like that, put them in, in, in jeopardy or in danger to be persecuted again and again and again by the by the police and and the government who do not want to decriminalize sex work. So yeah, it is important to put the the, the stories out there, but at the same time, is to use those platforms to say like, here is a community who need our support by fixing their status, by provide them education, by provide them with other options, so they can actually choose to be sex workers or to be a doctor or to be a teacher or to be a cosmetologist or to be whatever they want to be, a lawyer, in, even a, a lawyer. So yes, it's good to put their stories out there, but it's extremely important not to be so specific. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, another panelist, Mastane Mogadam, and I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly. I have Louis, uh, who works with uh, cross-cultural expressions. Thank you for joining us, Mastani. Yeah, no, you pronounced it great. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about the, you know, we talked about, you know, in these films about the activism and, you know, the work that's important to do, but uh, if you could tell us a little bit about the resources that are out there for people struggling, you know, uh, in terms of their mental health and how to, you know, to navigate sort of uh, the very, you know, difficult existences that uh, the trans people and people in the LGBT community face often. Yeah, I mean, uh, first off, I want to thank uh, the uh, directors and producers for creating these films. I had the opportunity to watch both, and I thought they were both extraordinary in telling the, st the very real stories um, that they were telling. Um, you know, I think a lot of times the uh, mental health uh, gets ignored because there's so much going on. Um, and it's really portrayed, I think, well in both the stories because a lot of times uh, people struggling with these issues are going through immigration stuff, family stuff, uh, work, finances, schooling. There's so much that they're dealing with that the mental health almost goes on the back burner and not paid attention to, and yet it's such a core part of um, what helps them ultimately get through all the other stuff. So there are a lot of resources out there. I'm in the LA area. There's certainly a lot of resources in the LA area, um, uh, a lot of resources through Los Angeles Department of Mental Health. Um, and a lot of really great organizations. Uh, our organization, Cross Cultural Expression, does provide mental health services and support groups. Um, I work primarily with the Middle Eastern LGBTQ plus populations. Um, we have groups for parents of LGBTQ plus. We have groups for individuals themselves. Um, I work closely with an organization called Raha International, which is a Iranian uh, Middle Eastern or I call it Iranian LGBTQ organization. But there are so many others, and obviously, um, you know, you can Google in your area or chat, and a lot of the organizations do serve the Latino-speaking populations. But I think whether you're uh, speaking of, um, you know, the trans community or as portrayed in nowhere communities that, um, you know, our students who are out here working, I think that the mental health issues that they're struggling with, the depression, the anxiety, um, the suicidality that for these communities is at eight times greater than for the um, average community member. Uh, these things can't be ignored and should really be paid attention to because paying attention to the mental health kind of helps guide all these other aspects. 
you know, and in that sense, when when we talk about you know mental health and resources, uh, why is it so important that that these are organizations that specifically you know support the LGBT community as as opposed to a more sort of general sort of uh, um, yeah you know mental health support? Because I feel like it, it's very important that these these communities have access that is tailored or with people that understand their specific and unique struggles. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, you want to work with organizations who are conf confirming of the identity. Um, uh, you also want to work with organizations that not only uh, the culture of like the LGBTQ plus uh, community, but also the um, uh, culture that they come from uh, is addressed because both of those go hand in hand uh, and there has to be an understanding on the part of the provider uh, of the intersectionality of both of those identities when working with someone because neither can be ignored. Um, and at the same time, you also have to be, uh, you know, well-versed enough to know that at the end of the day, you also have to look at the particular needs of the individual you're serving. And so all of those goes hand in hand. And so going to a, you know, more mainstream or a organization or a provider or a counselor who may not have the knowledge or the experience to really look at those different aspects may not serve the individual as well as really working with organizations who uh, do this and really pay attention to the specific needs. Absolutely. Uh, Ishala, I wanted to go back to you and ask you about, you know, your take on, you know, the, the access to, to mental health support for the trans community and, and in your experience, what, how, how that's, you know, impacted or been, uh, yeah, or if you found support in that regard. Well, for, for people who is undocumented, basically the access to mental health is new. Uh, usually the support groups that exist around the country and uh, here in New York City is based on HIV founding. So most of the time, those support groups are like based on um, workshops around HIV prep, et cetera, but it's not specifically to address um, the uh, intersectionality of the trans community, because yes, we've been, we've been labeled as Latinx trans community, but every country for, from where we are coming from have a different culture, a different meaning of, of life, uh, different struggles, and so So there is no funding to address those issues. So um, for example, um, everybody talks about uh, how difficult has been for the trans community this past uh, whole year of the pandemic. The, the, com the trans community is the one ha that has been served the less all over the country and all over New York City. So it is, it is very, um, it's very difficult for them to have access because we need to remember that uh, the struggles with gender identity goes beyond just that uh, is specific because you are struggling with gender identity you are struggling with not do, having uh, documents to be not persecuted here by immigration blah 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 and also living as a sex workers which is criminalized so all that intersectionality of cr criminalized uh, perceptions in in life it it takes a whole of our mental health and uh, surviving the pandemic, uh, knowing that you cannot go and work in the street because everything is closed. You don't know how you're gonna pay your rent. You don't have the protections of the, uh, basically the, the city that you cannot be evicted. There has been cases of trans women being evicted, even that it is a law uh, that we cannot be evicted. So all of those issues are extremely important to address. Unfortunately, there is no funding because most of the funding is based on education of HIV or treating people who live with HIV. And those who live with HIV have a little bit of access, but it's not enough either. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Nicola, in your film, we do have a scene with Lorena specifically addressing the importance of, of mental health. I wanted to uh, to ask about that component of what the organization you uh, you work with uh, uh, does. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, um, um, the Colectivo Intercultural Transgrediendo is um, is uh, an activist organization, and uh, 
and they also provide, but some of them also provide for um, main, uh, through, through the CHN, which is the Community Health ne Network, uh, they provide support to people who are criminalized that end up in the Human Trafficking Intervention Court. And so um, what, um, what we show in the film is, um, is the process through which people are, are supported when they get arrested and then, uh, and, and then, um, and then supported also through the asylum case. Because uh, many of the people, uh, just complementing what has been said so far, they also have traumas that come from their journey in the country of origin, but also when, when they come to the U.S., and in many cases, one of the few uh, support systems in place is, is the T visa, which is the trafficking visa, uh, uh, which uh, they need to apply for. And the process of, 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 of application is a very detailed one. And, and the film documents Paloma going through it. And, uh, and there is, a, there is uh, some uh, psychological support offered to people who ha suddenly have to unpack everything they've been through and, and you know in order to be believed in, in uh, by authorities and have a chance of having humanitarian protection and, and a leave to remain in the US this is something that is is, is very heavy because m m many people as we all do uh, sometimes they'd rather get on with life and, and not uh, unnecessarily unpack everything because you know it's very complicated and complex for everybody to deal with one's own trauma. So we wanted to show, and the collective wanted to show this process. And, and in many cases, people uh, could could um, could finally through the asylum process, even if it's a very unjust process in terms of uh, you know the the success rate and what it entails. But some mental health services enabling them to to both uh, deal with the trauma that uh, emerged from having to you know, tell themselves uh, to, to authorities, but also more broadly. Absolutely. Before we, we move on to another panel, I wanted to you know, go back to Francisco and David. And, and in your case, I feel like you know, the, the way that uh, the mental sort of stress that the characters feel, you know, to me, that's what plays into uh, their relationship falling apart. Um, and, I wanted to ask about that and how, you know, that the stress of the both of their secrets, you know, related to the sexual orientation and immigration plays a role in, in, in even having a romantic relationship, you know, uh, having carrying all that baggage. Do you want to take this one, Fred? No, I'll let you. Okay. So I think one of the things that we talked a lot about when we were, when we were working on the film and the script was um, the fear um, that Adrian feels about, you know, coming out to his parents. Um, you know, him coming from a, you know, we talked a lot about Colombian society and, and while we, there is a lot of progress and especially in the bigger cities, there's a lot more progress and, and respect for the LGBTQ community, there still does exist a major stigma. And, and one of the things that actually we talked a lot about was that there are not that many films that represent the LGBTQ community in Colum made in Colombia um, back in 2017 when we first made this movie. And in the time since there's been a little bit more activity, but still the representation and respect for the community just isn't there and especially um, with regards to like the class structure in Colombia and and how people view you know um, that class structure and how they how they um, you know what their expectations are within that um, that was one of the things that we zeroed on in with Adrian's story and his fear and as to why that adds to the stress level of why he needs them to stay in the US so he doesn't have to go back and face that challenge in Colombia. So that fear was really at the core of the major conflict between these two characters. And then you have Sebastian on the other end, who you know doesn't come from the same exact background as Adrian, but also faced you know that his father kicking him out of his house and rejecting him for being gay, and and so how that also influences Adrian's own fear toward his parents. So those that aspect was really central to the the conflict between the two of them and obviously that was further exacerbated by the fact that you know they don't know where their what their situation is with regards to the visa and the future of of being in the united states which is the only place where they felt comfortable expressing themselves and being together um openly absolutely um i want to bring on uh doralina luna who's an immigration lawyer thank you for joining us doralina thank you thank you for having me 
Um, I wanted to start by asking, you know, you, you know, I'm sure you've been listening to, uh, you know, everything that everyone has shared, you know, uh, in your experience or how has been your experience working with, you know, at this intersection of, you know, uh, immigration and the LGBT plus community? Well, first of all, there, there are a lot of moving parts when it comes to uh, trying to, to immigrate and already having these things that are against you, like your, your identity, the reason that you left your country, and also uh, if you have any money or not, or how did you cross? Uh, one of the things that I was able to notice as, as I was listening to everybody, uh, one of the main things is a language barrier. I really see that a lot, and, and also the access to legal assistance. Um, if, you, if you're a person who was trafficked, if you're a person who is escaping your country, those are, those are singular issues that are not necessarily the same as, as people who don't have uh, that added stigma of being a part of the LGBTQ plus community and, and a person of color. So uh, I see that as added stress, which, which in turn uh, makes everything worse in terms of your mental health and the trauma. Uh, these are uh, a population that need an added assistance and added support. You know, and, and in that sense, what is the sort of support that can be provided or what are the avenues to which, you know, uh, someone like you can uh, try to help or support uh, these communities in the immigration process? Uh, well, one of the responsibilities that we have as attorneys is to, you know, we're problem solvers, right? So we have to find a solution. We don't always, uh, we aren't always able to find a solution, but for sure uh, we we try to solve not just the legalization issue, but also others. Uh, for example, a lot of these humanitarian visas have, have a mental health component. For example, a T visa, we have to prove that that the client will suffer extreme hardship if they can't, if they have to go back to their home country. So we, the first thing that we do is we try to put in some mental health services, some counseling, some psychosocial assessments to prove that same with asylum or a U visa or even people who qualify uh, as uh, survivors of family violence so so that is the first thing that that we try to do um one of the things that I, that i have noticed is that the legalization you know the getting of a green card the getting of a work permit really solves a lot of problems in terms of stress it reduces your stress it makes you able to to work um once you get a green card or or, or legalized you're able to go to school you're able to access uh, government services uh you're able to um, get more mental health, and and I think once things stabilize a little bit, um, clients are able to say, you know what, I want my name changed, and say, yes, you you were able to do that back then, but what was most urgent was you being okay, you being okay here, because it, it's a huge, uh, I call it the the monkey on your back, is this stress that you feel every morning, every morning you wake up and you know. You know that you don't have papers. You know that you can get caught. You know that you could be going down the street and, and Border Patrol is going to, to stop you. So so that that's one of the, the first things that we try to do. We we approach uh, first, what, what can we do to help? How can we make you um, be legalized here in the country? And also, how do we help with in terms of mental health services? How has that changed, you know, over the past four years of the previous administration, you know, in terms of like becoming more difficult? And is there hope that with the new administration, there will be any sort of more relief generally for, for immigrants and more specifically for the LGBT plus community? Well, one of the, the, the main thing that I have seen because of a new administration is uh, people are slowly coming out of the shadows. The last four years were traumatizing uh, even for us uh, but especially for people who are who are hiding who are scared and and I've seen very slowly people are starting to kind of come up for air and saying hey I think there there may be something for me is there something for me uh, which is which is wonderful because we have we have hope again that something is going to happen uh, and with that hope comes people coming in and we're able to say, you know what, you actually qualify for this other thing or this thing that's already in place. Absolutely. Uh, Ishala, I wanted to once again go back to you and, and talk to you about the 
uh, you know, I think is very sort of delicate, this, this notion that in order to qualify for certain visas, you have to prove uh, that you've suffered enough of that, you've gone to certain things. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to, if you do have anything to share in terms of like how difficult or, or wrong or, you know, complicated that is for, for the trans community to have to prove, you know, the suffering for in exchange for a visa. I think I think we are like not stepping in the right direction with when we talk about that because the simple fact of being trans person it is already a um, um, it should be treated already as a difficult life. Uh, we don't need to be proving anything because is what society has made for us. We have to remember that every single month, basically, in the United States, one trans woman is being a uh, murder. And um, that should say it all. As a trans woman, we should not be re-traumatized for a process to provide us uh, the, um, the legalization in this country. We have to endure the bully since we put the first, I mean, we breathe the first time in this earth just by being trans woman. So all of these processes, like for example, I have to be two months in prison because of the process of the United States. I asked for asylum at the border and the first option I got was to be in prison. The second option I got was if I was afraid of being with the general population, I will have to be in solitary confinement in order for me to be safe. So the, the first option the United States has to uh, provide me as a secure or safe space was a solitary confinement, something created to punish criminal people, to punish people that is aggressive and kill others. Why just for being a trans woman, I have to be in solitary confinement. That is a wrong duration of the country that brag around the world of being the most democratic and most welcoming country in the world. Another situation that is extremely important to address is that a person who received the papers, if it's a cisgender identified individual, most likely will have this stress be released. But it's not going to happen for a trans woman who cannot get a job, even if they are legalized. Why? Because the, the, the papers or the profile that is being looked through the, through the uh, companies state that we need to be a, cer a certain level of education. We are not taking into consideration that this country, the United States, do not allow trans women to go to school until just a decade the last decade even today we still is there is places in this country that do not allow us to go to the bathroom uh, according to our gender identity so that is something that has to be in the mind of those in companies inclusive inclusively of those on organizations that are pro-lgbtq community that mm -hmm. continue writing job descriptions saying that we need to be uh, a certain certain level of education that we unfortunately do not have Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I wanted to bring on uh, our uh, last, you know, new panelist for this session, Kendrick Ross uh, from the National Queer Asian Pacific Islander Alliance. Are we with us, Kendrick? Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Sorry I cannot be on screen. I have a hamstring injury that has left me kind of no uh, bed bound, um, but I. If you can hear me okay, I, I think that's good. Great, thank you for joining us, no worries. Um, I wanted to start by asking you about, you know, the intersectional work that, that your organization does and how crucial it is, you know, in this uh, this particular moment uh, uh, in the history of this country and as it relates to people of color and, and the LGBTQ plus community. Um, absolutely. Um, and I also wanna say, I'm the films were, were amazing and I'm I grew up in New York to to see uh, the different takes on it is was um, very impactful. So in terms of Encapia, um, our work centers around intersections of LGBTQ, IA, and uh, Asian Asian Pacific Islander communities, and the intersection of of immigration and our work has been part of Encapia since we started because of the over this is foundational. So 
API communities are about 6% of the general American population, but API folks account for about a third of immigrants in the United States, of documented immigrants in the United States. And that is also in the LGBTQ community. So while we are, we are tremendously overrepresented as a group, among LGBTQ immigrants in general, and we're also overrepresented as a group among undocumented LGBTQ immigrants. So while we are about 30% of all LGBTQ immigrants, we are about 12, 13% of undocumented um, LGBTQ immigrants. So at least a doubling of, of our representation. And in terms of Encapi's work, it is about safety. And we define, particularly at this point where we have a lot of um, conversation, thankfully, around um, violence towards API communities in the United States, there has been a lot of conversation around safety. And from Encapi's point of view and from the federation of organizations that we represent, safety is not just about passing laws or, or I mean, God forbid, increasing surveillance. It is about creating a society where all of us, including um, and very much including undocumented people, have access to a sustainable, thriving existence in the United States. And this, so that's the, the kind of lens that we approach our work through. So in terms of the kinds of topics we are discussing today, we we put a lot of weight behind advocating for um, family-based immigration for it to continue to the United States. That has been under attack tremendously for the last four years. We continue to advocate for a pathway to citizenship. Um, and we, of course, continue to advocate for things like um, liberalizing asylum policies and lifting the cap on refugees. So those are the issues we are we're talking about and in, in that work we we also understand that while we are overrepresented among um lgbtq immigrants documented or undocumented we're still small communities so these are these are communities within communities they're closets within closets and one one of those things is that when when we have these small communities that are constantly under pressures of deportation orders or squads or things like that and then you also have people who are under pressure of of living in their own communities where there tends to be at times rampant homophobia and in a larger lgbtq community in which they are invisible or either fetishized or desexualized those are multiple compounding um, traumas that they deal with. Absolutely. Uh, in that in that regard, when you know in in recent weeks we've seen uh, you know terrible attempts at at sort of you know that attempt against the the humanity and the rights of trans people in this country. Uh, are there any sort of like movements or steps or or, or actions that the community at large can take? right now uh, to, to fight against these this bills that have been introduced in, in recent days? Um, absolutely. So I would say that we are, we're moving towards an election next year where children will be seen, will be portrayed as the greatest threat to America. Uh, trans children in our schools and um, largely black and brown children on our borders. That is the building culture war argument I see coming. Um, it's very much the, you know, Ebola crisis that we we supposed to have had, um, I think in 2014, that this is not going to stop until we stand up. Um, clearly we have an administration now that listens more to these concerns, but from our point of view, from Incapi's point of view, we, we don't look at uh, specific legislation, but now we have so many bills. I think there's 20 bills alone that have been introduced this year, um, including uh, two in, in the South that have been uh, passed. 
So it's not a matter of just one piece of legislation. We have to tackle this as a, as a national crisis of misinformation, disinformation, and going back to, to arguments, some arguments are no longer working to hate and criminalize people. So our enemies have moved on to others. And something um, Ishala said that is, I, I think is very important of how in particular uh, people of trans experience and, and trans folks are, are treated differently within and I will say treated worse within LGBTQ um, spaces is the the rise of, of the anti-trans movement in in this country, right? At the same time that we we passed Title we 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 said both sexual orientation and gender identity are covered under Title Seven gender on a national level last year. We still have these situations where um, trans folks are being separated from the rest of the LGBTQ acronym for particular um, virulent treatment. And this has, been, this has been going on for a long time. And one of NCAPIA's, uh, a situation we worked on for a very, very long time, for two years, was on behalf of a trans man um, named Chin who was placed in solitary confinement for 15 months in an ICE facility. This is beyond inhumane. Um, because I said, we don't know what to do with trans people. So we decided to lock someone up in without any contact with the outside world. And the reason why this person got into ICE's trap is a technical glitch that they, he was a natural, he was, he had gotten a green card, had lost his green card. The database said he naturalized as a citizen. He could not apply for a green card anymore because the system said he was a citizen, but there was no proof of him being a citizen. So ergo, he became undocumented. And because of a, a glitch in the system, he was criminalized he was put in solitary confinement because he was a trans person who had been a victim of a glitch in the system. You know, when, when, and that's a question for you, Ken, uh, Ken Regan, for anyone else in the panel, you know, when, when you're facing, uh, you know, an entire system that is not even, you know, hasn't even fully acknowledged, you know, the existence of uh, specifically the trans community, how do you operate within you know, within a system like that, that isn't even, you know, at a basic level, uh, recognizing the humanity and, and, and doesn't know how to address uh, the needs and struggles of the trans community. Um, I'll, I'll say quickly from Incapia's point of view, and then I'm sure other panelists can speak more on this. From, from the work we do, I, I feel there are many parts to movement and we have to be everywhere, outside the doors, banging, at the tables, um, in the streets, in Congress, from our, our approach to this, it is the slow, painful, hard work of changing policy and bringing to bear. So we, we tell stories, we make sure that we um, demand action from, from this administration, but we do so by utilizing the resources. We do so by utilizing allies, politically allies, socially, and Encapia for itself has a robust family acceptance program. So we also have a lot of family work that um, we have people who can speak, not just an impact that let's say an anti-trans bill has on themselves, but on their children, on their parents, um, which I think is, is something that I, I personally love about Encapia, that we bring that spectrum of experiences to say, this is when, when you target somebody, when you criminalize somebody, when you exclude somebody, there are traumatic effects on families and communities as, as well. And, and they are part of our organization. Um, anyone else want to jump in and, and go ahead? Yeah, well, just to um, 
kind of address what uh, you were just saying. I think it's so important to uh, pay attention to what you can do for an individual or on an individual level. I think that if you look at the issues in this kind of big, broad uh, way, it can sometimes feel overwhelming and very hopeless. And so I think one of the um, important uh, facets to always keep in mind, um, whether you're an individual going through these things or you're a service provider is, uh, or a filmmaker, you know, is that every individual st uh, story has so much power and so much impact on the mental well-being of everybody, you know, of the whole. And so even if you can only just help yourself, you're doing a lot for the greater good. Even if you can only help one person or tell one person's story, you're doing so much for the greater good. And to not let yourself become hopeless or overwhelmed because the system seems to be so broken and the system seems to be so difficult to penetrate. So just to keep in mind that every moment that you're able to uplift yourself or any one individual, you're doing the world of good. Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Yes. Well, I wanted to. No, you go. Oh, thank you. Very briefly, I wanted to mention that as an attorney, one of the one of the great things about being an immigration attorney is that we we help each other out. We are consistently helping each other, uh, giving each other uh, ideas and and case decisions. Uh, we have several groups on Facebook that are are specifically uh, about certain topics. Um, and one of the things that I, I like to say that you know we're we're healers, we're counselors, um, and and we want to find a solution to the problem. So working with each other, we we tend to to think about ideas like, hey, you need to access your congressional uh, representative to see if you can do something about this case. Or we say, hey, you know, your client maybe should move to the fifth circuit or to the ninth circuit because this is going to help. Uh, the other thing, and, and just kind of adding to to the mental health aspect, it, it's also about helping the client help themselves. You know, we're not here to to do everything in the client to do nothing. Where we want to also empower empower the person to to help us to help them in the case. So so it's it's really a, a teamwork kind of thing, not just with the client, but also with with the attorneys and everybody else who wants to help. And, and also absolutely community organizations because they're they're huge in terms of of accessing us and working with us uh, to to get something done. Absolutely, Nicola, you wanted to add? Yes, I just wanted to add something that Doralina just mentioned as well, which is the importance of community organizations. They they do uh, very important work and they are underfunded. And during COVID, you know, the Colectivo it distributed food, medicines and care that was not available to the community through any, any other, um, you know, means. And, uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that this, this is something that we, we, we talk about because sex work is a very stigmatized activity. And in the U.S. it is criminalized and it, it is also a subculture. And so people feel more at ease and trust people who have a similar experience and they're more comfortable talking about what they're going through with people who are not going to judge them for it. Mm -hmm. And and so I think community organizations should be, uh, you know, dealing with and representing the rights of sex workers should, should receive funding. Um, in the UK, the uh, sorry, I'm from the UK, so I mix it up. In the US, uh, the... Um, the fact that uh, sex work is criminalized means that trafficking became an all catching category to talk about sex work. And, uh, and, uh, and that's a bit of a catch 22 situation because we end up talking about trafficking when it's not a case of trafficking because it's the only instrument of protection we have. And so this is a segue into saying the second point I wanted to make, which is uh, I think LGBTQ organizations should mainstream sex workers' rights and migrants' rights as part of their intersectional focus because they are a very important component on their communities of care and, and they are interrelated issues. Nicola, since, since 
since uh, just going off of what you were saying, uh, is the film, you know, hopefully being used as a informational tool or a resource? Is that sort of the, the goal with, with the film that you created? That's my hope. My hope for the film was that it would become a way to, to elevate voices that are already there, that are very powerful, uh, and, 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 and that it would become exactly that. This is why uh, Lorena wanted to make the film. This is why Liam and the Collectivo wanted to do it. So th that's my hope. I really would like that to be, and I'm really grateful uh, that the film was included in this festival because that's actually the, the intention in making it. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here, I think perhaps for Doralina, which, you know, in a general sense, you know, what are some tangible steps that someone who is undocumented can take to begin the process of legalization? Is there anything they should avoid that could jeopardize their options? And I know that this is, as a DACA recipient myself, I know that the, that the answer might be very complex and tricky. <laughs> I'll make it simple. Uh, try to Try to read about your situation, but mostly try to access a community organization. The first step I would say to to access maybe the consulate of your of your country. For example, I, I work with the Mexican consulate to do a, a lot of DACA workshops, like free DACA workshops, uh, but also uh, if uh, there's nonprofits that are accredited by the Board of Immigration Appeals, so they have um, much uh, lower fees, uh, but, but also just Go do one one consult with an immigration attorney. Mm -hmm. Just one consult, and and that attorney should be able to tell you what what you qualify for, or tell you if you maybe you had a ticket a, a few years ago, maybe you were arrested a few years ago, and and you've been worrying about this arrest for a long time, and. It, it, a lot of times people come to my office and I look at the arrest and I said, no, no, you're fine because you did the classes. It's dismissed. It doesn't count. And, and people just look at me and go, ah, because they had no idea. And, and to me, the first step is go, go access, go to a nonprofit, go to an attorney and, and we'll, we'll try to help you out as much as we can. Absolutely. Um, in that sense, I feel like it's interesting to talk about, you know, in Francisco and David's film, the, uh, the the very specific and, and challenging you know topic of the marriage and how the the characters try to approach their situation in yeah. that way uh, was that something that uh, that you took from anecdotal information or what was the intention behind tackling that uh, that I feel like is very much uh, known in the immigrant community but that is not often talked about in, in the mainstream. Yeah. Well, so um, go ahead, Frank. Well, actually, um, one of uh, our friends who was in, who was studying from Colombia, he had been offered um, uh, to get married uh, with uh, to to get married with some some stranger and create this whole scenario so that they could he could get his visa, um, and that was something that we also did a couple of re some research uh, based on that um, because it's something that 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 has that that we also spoke to about with other people as well. Um, it was. Those. It was actually a larger framework of the original version of the film. Um, there was actually, a mu it was much more developed than there were other characters involved. Um, but ultimately we kind of decided that we didn't want to focus too much on that. We wanted to focus more on um, Adrian and Sebastian's uh, challenges and the, the fear that they had um, that I spoke with to earlier. But yeah, for, for us, that was actually a major part of when we spoke with this this friend of ours that my brother mentioned, um, that became a major point of focus and a major point of our research and trying to figure out um, the, all of the parties involved in something like this um, from a from a different perspective. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, before we we begin wrapping, I wanted to go back to Ishala and you know and ask you, you know after this whole conversation that we have had on these issues. Uh, what would you think is the, the most important takeaway or that people should understand or try to understand in order to, to support and, and, and uplift the, the trans community? I think it's extremely important that everybody be vocal about the issues, but also is to believe when someone is saying that something is happening with them. Uh, I will put myself with uh, as example, like right now, currently I sued Hunter College, is the college I go to and they misgender me. I, I make a case within the uh, college uh, system and structure. They did not believe me. I have to take this case to the New York, uh, New York Commission of Human Rights. Uh, we are demanding them um, 
because they misgendered me, they segregate me, did not allow me to go to the ex, um, classroom. And that is part of the problem that is happening all over, is that the whole system, it is done and is structured for cis people, male and female, cisgender identify. And we are restructuring everything and that is the reason of the hatred that we have every single day in all of aspects of our life even if you are a dishwasher if you are a transgender you will be bullied in that job and that work and that is happening if you are a sex worker and if you are immigrant you will be bullied in two different ways for being in undocumented for being an immigrant for being a sex worker so when we want to be vocal we just we don't want to be vocal as trans women making a, a case. We need the cis LGBT, LGB people to support us because we have been there for you all when you are making your cases. So it is extremely different, the perspective of these two movies in which in, in, in one is sex workers, transgender, having an extremely difficult time. And in the other is two high educated gay guys who has enduring a difficult in their life or not being able to come out of the closet. And that is a tremendous difference between the struggles of a gay guy and a trans woman. And it should help to understand how difficult is the, the life of a trans woman compared with the life of a gay male. For example, Mexico right now, the consul, I've been trying to reach them in many different ways to make sure that trans women in the United States who go through the process of name change can use the judge order to make the change name in the United States to do the same case for Mexico. There is no answer from them so far. They are asking people to go through the same process in Mexico, being misgendered there, even if they already have that process done in the United States and it's been acknowledged here. So those processes are extremely difficult for us. It's very traumatizing and we want to be vocal, but we need your support. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's important, like you mentioned, to acknowledge those the privileges and the differences that, that exist even within uh, within this community. So I, I really uh, thank you for, for sharing with us and for being so vocal and uh, thank you so much, Isabel. Um, before we wrap, I uh, wanted to ask each of you if you want to give us, you know, a little bit of information on where people can find you or your organization and contact you. Uh, where can they see your films next, uh, or, or if they'll be available for people to watch elsewhere? Uh, so why don't we start with Nicola? Okay. Well, um, I'm um, I'm a sociologist, so I will I will give the 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 address. I mean, the, I will point people to the Colectivo Intercultural Transgrediendo because they are the people who can help. And uh, you can look them up. You can also look them uh, up at Voces Latinas. It's on 83rd Street in, uh, in in Queens. They are a community organization. They tend to meet on on Saturdays. They have lots of activities and they would be a very uh, precious point of call for people uh, you know migrants trans people or or, or anybody really in, in in that situation to to receive help from uh, in terms of care this is the first festival it's been it's been screened at um there will be hopefully many more but at the moment there are no other uh, screenings of the film uh, scheduled but you know i'm being hopeful and keep everything crossed Absolutely. You can still, you know, watch the film for the next couple of days throughout the session. So don't miss that chance if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, Francisco and David, where can people see your work next? Um, so uh, you can, for any information about any of uh, other films, La Cuarta Productions, uh, .com. Um Nowhere is currently screening at Outfest Fusion uh, till the 20th. And then we're going to, and we're also screening this weekend at the Roving, uh, Roving Eye Film Festival as well. And we're going to be uh, going to the Sunscreen Film Festival in Florida and St. Petersburg uh, at the end of the month. Uh, we'll be at in Mumbai as well um, in May. And we are also uh, slated for another festival in um, at the in November, I think August. And so. the film is streaming on Deku as well as you can rent it on Amazon. And there's also a DVD released by TLA releasing. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Mastane? 
You're muted. You are muted. We cannot hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to sit with all of you. Um, the organization that I'm the executive director of is called Cross Cultural Expressions. Uh, we are a mental health organization and we do offer uh, mental health services, individual couples, therapy and support groups. Um, and we work very closely, as I said, with the LGBTQ plus uh, community. And uh, you can contact us uh, via our website, cceccc.com, um, or look us up on Facebook, Cross Cultural Expressions. And again, thank you for uh, the movies and the organizers for having me. Thank you. Uh, can we uh, tell us about where can people find uh, your organization and any other remarks that, that, that you want to you wanna share with us? Um, sure. So um, I am the executive director of Encopia. I put our um, address right there. So it's uh, encopia.org. Um, we are we are a federation of, of 62 small community-based CBOs. Um, they're called CBOs across the country. So if you are you are an API person who is looking for a local community home, um, we can definitely put you in touch. Uh, in 14 different states and two territories. We also have a, a robust uh, policy agenda. We are going to be unveiling in the next coming weeks, uh, centering around um, certainly immigration, but uh, also tackling the rise of the trend, anti-trans bills across the country, and also looking at issues around health and um, community care. The one thing I would say is that I would add to this is that the one of the things we're, we're looking at is also the trauma of the last four years of so many people in our communities living in fear of detention and deportation and what that has done. So I, I was actually running a DACA uh, funded program um, when Donald Trump won the presidency. And I remember getting tons of calls from people who were who are starting to come out of the shadows, both because of DACA and potentially DAPA, and their entire world and entire future that they thought they would have was being uh, kind of overturned. And that led to four years of intense scrutiny, um, not just hiding, but it's it's a level of trauma that I've seen in, in communities, including in my family, that we are just now trying to understand and we're trying to dig out of so that's something that you know we didn't cover very much but that's a, also an element of the immigration um work that i think all of us need to do to make sure that people 10 15 years even um are still not um living under the fear of that final removal order that the government can um, execute at any time and put them in places that that are not their country and are not their home. Thank you so much for that, Kenrick. Um, Doralina, where can people uh, find you? And your yes, well, the, the easiest way to find me is uh, www.doralina.com. That'll route you to my Facebook page for my law firm. Also, I wanted uh, to share the website for Mariposas Sin Fronteras. That is a group that helps uh, LGBTQ Q plus uh, trans community uh, detainees and in immigration detention centers. Uh, and that is mariposasinfronteras.org. And I'll put that link on my Facebook page. I do want to say thank you to Nick for CAER. It, it really educates all of us uh, in in learning how to to access that there is something out there uh, for for everyone some sort of, of help and and that is very uh, uplifting uh, and also uh, to to Francisco and David for nowhere to for reminding us of the anguish that is felt uh, that, that people feel um, because of their status and because of the lack of options for the lack of of resources and 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 I want to thank you all very much and thank you for inviting me here. Take over here. Lastly, uh, Ishallah, how can help you people find you and support you? And, and again, thank you so much for sharing with us. 
No, thank you. Yes, everybody can find me on all of the social media as La Gran Inshala. Uh, also, you can find my music. I'm an artist uh, in all music platforms, the same, La Gran Inshala. And also, I would like to share that I particip with, participate with multiple um, different organizations, pro-LGBT and all sort of uh, social justice um, organizations. I will say immigration equality, which I am a former um, client of them, and also Familia Transquid Liberation Movement that I serve as a, as a um, board member board, um, co um, what's the name of this? Uh, advisory board member. So Familia Transquid Liberation Movement, also in all of the platforms, we work for people who is, um, in detention centers, as well as trying to um, to create new leadership around the country and the world. So yes, La Gran Ishala in every platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. And thank you to Artface Fusion for, uh, for hosting this conversation. Thank you so much everyone for watching. Thank, thank you, you very much. much for having us. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Thank you.